In many businesses, there exists a substantial gap between what the company proclaims in their mission statement and the actual lived experiences of its employees. This discrepancy often leads to a superficial company culture where the values and goals touted by the organization are not really integrated into its daily operations and its employee interactions. Of course, when things go terribly, terribly wrong, that's when the BS meter goes absolutely haywire. And that's what we're talking about today on Mark Hain Live. Welcome to this episode. This is where small business owners and entrepreneurs develop new skills to help them create the jaw-dropping, show-stopping experience that their customers and their employees deserve. I am your host, customer and employee experience strategist, Mark Hain. I am so glad that you are here with us today. My guest for this episode is the restaurant rock star, Roger Baudouin. And today we are going to put a spotlight on how you can shift from the superficial mission and vision statement that's plastered all over the wall to a deep-seated company culture that increases team satisfaction and better overall business outcomes. I have one simple request. If there is somebody in your circle who could benefit from the insights that we're sharing today, do them a favor and pass along a link to this episode. As I always say in this ep in this show, knowledge is power, but only if it's shared. I have to tell you, my 30 plus years working as a hospitality specialist, supporting all sorts of customer facing businesses on how to become more hospitable in their service offerings, more time than not, the businesses that struggle the most had a disconnect between leadership, team empowerment, and the elusive concept of company culture. So that, brings us to our question of the day. So when was the last time that you felt your team was deeply connected to your company's mission? Are your people just going through the motions or are they truly engaged and driving the businesses forward with a shared understanding and passion for what you guys are doing? I'd love for you to share your experiences. Why don't you go ahead and post it in the comment box below, or you can go ahead and share this episode on your favorite social media platform, hashtag it experience leadership, and become part of this conversation. Today, my guest is, as I mentioned, the restaurant rock star, Roger Baudouin, a man who not just walks the talk, but has danced, sprinted, and marathon ran through the world of entrepreneurship and hospitality. Roger, it's so great to have you on the show. Welcome, my brother. What a glowing introduction. I can't thank you enough, Mark, for having me here. Thank you. Lovely to have you. Hey, before we get too deep into today's topic, could you tell us a little bit about how you serve your clients? Yeah, so Restaurant Rockstars is about 10 years old now, and it all started with mostly my hospitality experience. It was 23 years own, owning restaurants that I founded from scratch. Now, when I first started my restaurants, um, I didn't have any restaurant experience, but I did have a, an advantage. It was business skills that I got from a top um, MBA program. And I applied these business skills and systems to a business which isn't traditionally run by MBAs. And that made all the difference for me. So I had what you call a different approach. I call it a paradigm shift. And it was all about systems, but the foundational element was leadership and not management. And I could go on all day about the differences between those two things. Oh, and I'm sure we're going to get around to it. Absolutely. I, I talked a little bit about the disconnect between the vision state and mission statements that people actually go out and get laminated and plastered all over their wall uh, to the actual running of businesses. Uh, in, in your years of experience, what's been your experience seeing have you seen disconnects? Have you seen it connected? Tell us a little bit I about see that. A lot of connect. And I see it. I saw it when I ran and owned restaurants because we shopped the competition all the time. I had a mantra. It's like, play your best game, but always know what the competition is up to. So we analyzed their business. I even sent my own leaders that worked for me 
into different restaurants and said, go out to dinner at this place and report back. And they would almost be like secret shoppers for somebody else's business. And then they would bring back what they saw that was working and what wasn't working. And most of it was based on a very obvious lack of training and just order takers on the floor, people that weren't knowledgeable about the products of the restaurant, people that weren't bringing the experience to life, people that weren't using their unique personalities to be brand ambassadors for that business. We saw all of it, but it really was foundational to keep an eye on the competition. And now to the second part of that question is, for the past 10 years or so, I've also done personal restaurant coaching. I'll go into an organization, I'll either work on leadership and staff training, or I'll tear apart their finances and make the place more profitable, whatever it is. But I do coach and consult and I still see a lot of disconnect. And mostly it starts with that whole mission statement thing that you put a lot of emphasis on versus a true company culture, which is something that happens naturally by virtue of the leader or the owner's approach to treating people the right way and developing and nurturing and recognizes talent in people and giving them additional responsibility. That's what creates company culture. So I don't see that a lot. I remember when I first came to Alberta uh, from Montreal, I actually owned restaurants in Montreal and I came to Alberta for my first kind of corporate job. And my good friend, Lanny Stevenson, one of the best HR directors I've ever had the pleasure of working with, asked me what kind of corporate culture I thrived in. I didn't have a clue what she meant by that. I didn't know what she was talking about because, because I owned my own restaurants. My right. corporate culture was now that I, you know, when res retrospectively, I created the corporate culture that we lived in. I had, at, but at the time, I had no training. I had no real definition of what that is. I just knew we had a good time at work. We had a lot of people coming together. But maybe could you define what corporate culture actually is? I'll start with what my company culture was in all of my restaurants. And I'm going to go into a little bit of depth here and peel back the onion, but my company culture was hospitality, family, and fun in all my restaurants. And it starts with that magic word hospitality because that is the foundation of every hotel, restaurant, business that's guest facing and interacting. I learned a long time ago my definition of hospitality. I didn't create it. I heard it somewhere and I always love it and it's stuck and I train my people every single day. And I learned hospitality is absent when something happens to your guest. Hospitality is present when something happens for the guest. Huge difference there. So hospitality is the foundation. We want every person to introduce themselves by name and create a rapport and a relationship with the guest. I hate the word customer just as much as I hate the word manager. I use the word leader and I use the word guest. So you create a rapport, you build a relationship, you make friends with your guests every single day because that's what brings people back again. That's what gives them a feeling of affinity for your business where they've got this powerful sense of loyalty or belonging. You know, it's that old TV show, Cheers. People wanna go where everyone knows their name. It's that simple, okay? So there's the hospitality piece. The family piece is you want your team to feel a, a respect and a team bond and a chemistry, okay? So you want them to feel like family. You want them to enjoy working together. You want them to enjoy interacting with leaders. You want this symbiotic relationship. And then you also want your guests to feel like family, where they feel like they're regulars or they're recognized. Even if they're first time visitors to your business, you wanna treat everyone as if they're an old friend and you introduce yourself by name and you treat them like they, you see them five times a week. That's simple, that's family. And then fun. When the guests are having more fun, you know, when the staff are having more fun and making great money, then the guests are having more fun and spending more money. And all those things rolled together was our company culture. So again, every company culture is different in every single business, but it really starts with that mindset change and creating leadership. There's a huge difference between delegation and empowerment. We all know that word delegate and that gets overused too. I hate the word. It means you tell somebody what to do or even how to do it. Anybody can do that. That doesn't make you a leader. That makes you a boss or a manager that barks orders, right? Instead, empowerment is all about recognizing talent in people, inspiring them, motivating them, showing them that they can do better, showing them that they can take on additional responsibility. And when they do, giving them incentives for make mistakes. And instead of criticizing performance saying, go out and do it the right way, it's all about 
building them up and showing them how they can do things better until they get it and then recognizing that performance. And you got to do that, that all the time. I love, I love that we are two peas in a pod because that's what I've been preaching on this show forever. In your experience, are there any kind of telltale signs that a that, that it, the corporate culture is really superficial? Yeah, unhappy people and high turnover. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Your audience doesn't know this, but I've been in the restaurant business, I think I mentioned, for over two decades, owning and starting restaurants from scratch. But I sold all these properties in 2014. But then at the tail end of 2019, I had the brilliant idea of buying another restaurant, not knowing the pandemic is around the next corner. So sure. I've actually gone through everything that your audience has gone through during the pandemic. And I can walk the walk and say, you know, I had these challenges and I turned them around and it's possible with the right mindset and with the right approach versus the old way of being the boss and having a mission statement and not asking people what's wrong with the place. So here's where I'm getting with this, Mark. When I bought this restaurant just before the pandemic, you know, people are really uneasy about change we know this right a lot of people don't like change they like things just the way they are and whenever a business turns hands and a new owner comes in everybody kind of runs for the lifeboats and they're like what's the new owner going to be like is he going to be a jerk is he going to change everything we like the way things are or not but we don't want people to change things on us because we're used to it being that way well, I want to set people at ease. So I sat down with each and every one of the existing employees to get to know them on a personal level. One on one, we're in an office and I'm just having a basic discussion. I introduced myself, told them what I've done, told them what the plans were for the business. But here's where it impacted them. I said, tell me what's broken. Tell me what would make your job easier, your life happier here. What can we do to make your job more productive, more fun, easier, happier, whatever? And they sing like canaries. You don't ask, you don't get. But suddenly, if you ask them, their opinion matters. So the kitchen staff, oh, the kitchen's so hot. And it's 900 degrees, and there's no rubber mats in front of the equipment, and we're on our feet for like six hours. It's like, what can you do? So we air conditioned the kitchen, and we brought in the rubber mats. And we went so far as to buy Skechers, those really cushy shoes for the employees. Suddenly, they're happy again, and they're more productive. I had a baker that turned out like five you know our takeout business it was a breakfast place and we did the most amazing cinnamon buns and muffins and she had one of those 60 quart mixers you know and she's like the mixer it, it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't i'm in the middle of a bake and the thing's turning and all of a sudden it stops and the dough's stuck in there and i gotta kick it or i gotta juggle a plug or whatever we fix the mixer right it's like you don't ask you don't get everyone's opinion matters and that made all the difference and now suddenly people are happy to work there it lowers turnover it's all in your approach it you know what's interesting about that is the approach is more about the leadership taking humility and saying and admitting i don't have all the answers so why don't you feed me some of the answers why don't you tell me what you would like to see in your workspace Absolutely true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's an approach, right? It's a mindset mm -hmm. shift. And that's the difference between a leader and a boss. Yeah, yeah. How does, in your experience, how does um, the customer experience suffer in poor, in businesses with poor internal culture and poor leadership? It's immediately obvious. And I know that us as restaurant people and even some of your audience that, that may own restaurants and whatnot, you know, we're really close to the industry. We understand we have a very critical eye when we go into a hospitality business, but so do the guests in completely unrelated industries. They have certain expectations that have to be met and they don't walk in the door thinking of their expectations, but they wanna be recognized. They wanna be acknowledged. They wanna be served. They want a better experience that they might get somewhere else. And that's the hospitality piece. And unless you train your staff to know what these guest expectations are, they're not gonna get delivered. So we all know when we go out to a restaurant or even our employees that go out to restaurants, we, you know, we, we took it a step further. I told you about the leaders cross shopping different um, competitors. We also had employee incentives where we gave out um, gift cards to different businesses and whatnot. And some of them were restaurants and they would go to this restaurant and I'd informally ask them what was good, what was bad. 
But any of us that walk into a place, we know when things operating on eight cylinders or on four cylinders, we can see the, the chaos in some places versus the well-oiled machine in others. It's immediately obvious to the guest, and therein lies the danger. If your business isn't dialed on all cylinders, if you don't have the systems in place, if you don't have the A players that are treating your business as if they owned it and had to pay for it, chances are you're turning your guests on to someone else's restaurant that's doing a better job. Absolutely. Uh, and again, you know, being in the same kind of role as you going into operations that have been suffering for decades and trying, they're de trying desperately to compete in the, in the new modern mo uh, marketplace, uh, going into them and seeing the culture, really the only thing really holding them back. I told one owner, I said, you know, you're a real anchor to this place. And she goes, oh, why, thank you. And I said, no, no, what I don't, what I mean by that is because of the way that you've been managing since the 1970s, you're actually holding the place back. <laughs> And so we had a very strong, candid discussion about what needed to change in her leadership style in order to move things forward. Because, of course, the 1970s was a completely different reality than the, you know, the 2000s. And, and so it's really interesting. You mentioned this idea of delegation versus empowerment um, and how that really the empowerment piece is, is, the, is really the magic elixir. When we think about delegation and empowerment are the two mutually exclusive or is one actually more powerful than the other yeah again um i don't like the word delegation well let's okay. let's start with um the whole empowerment piece because i talked about the importance of recognizing talent in others and giving mm -hmm. them opportunities to take on additional responsibility not everybody wants additional responsibility. You might have an A player that's worked for you for 10 years and it's the best fry cook you ever had or the best dishwasher ever and they really don't want to do anything else. And that's okay. As long as they're a rock solid performer, not everyone wants to move up. But you need to offer opportunities to people so that they can enrich their lives, enrich their jobs, make more money, take on additional responsibility. And you need to find people that will be entrepreneurs. I love the word entrepreneur. Not everyone knows what that means, so I'll define it really quickly. We all know that an entrepreneur is someone that takes a risk and it's emotional risk, it's physical risks, it's financial risk in order to start a business in the hopes of making a profit. Entrepreneur, right? Entrepreneurs are the people that bring that skill set, that approach, that mindset to someone else's business and they work in it as if they owned it and they build that business up and they take on additional responsibility and they help grow the business on behalf of the owner. I had people like that for decades. Yeah. You want lots of people like that in your business, but you can't develop an entrepreneur if you don't give them the opportunity to take on that responsibility. But first it starts by recognizing talent, a spark in someone. You see something special and you say, that person can do much more than they're doing now, even if they're doing a stellar job in this gig, it's like, who knows where they could go? And you, and you should constantly be trying to build your people and moving them up. So we cross train people also. We had dishwashers that could be fry cooks. We taught them how to cook the fries. And we had bussers that could host. And we had servers that could jump behind the bar. And whenever somebody got sick or hit by a bus, it's like we had a backup plan, you know? And not every business has that. So it's all foundational stuff, but it all sort of comes together. But that's why empowerment is so much more important than delegation. Because again, anybody can tell somebody what to do and how to do it. That's delegation. Uh -huh. And anybody can bark orders at someone and call themselves the manager. But that doesn't mean that they're competent to lead or experienced or even, mo you know, in a position to motivate others and get the best performance out of people. I love that. And you have just given a really great synopsis of the episode prior to this one, where I talked all about entrepreneurship and organization. So oh, no kidding. I'm, well, apropos and um, serendipitous, I guess. It really is. I'd like to get into some strategies that we can use to kind of um, relight our leadership passion and to really help uh, leaders kind of find that spark that turns them from a manager into a leader. And we'll get to that right after this. When the spotlight shines on your business, are customers applauding or yawning? In other words, how is your business performing? 
make your business a star with the new book, Lights, Camera, Action, Business Operational Excellence Through the Lens of Live Theater by Mark Hain. Mark uses his business and acting experience to help you see your business like a live show so you can create a performance your customers will never forget. Buy Lights, Camera, Action today at your favorite online retailer or directly at markhain.com. I am speaking with the restaurant rock star, Roger Baudouin, and I had a sneaking suspicion I would feel like I was talking to a, uh, a colleague, uh, somebody who's been around the corner with me um, in my hospitality journey, and everything that we've been talking about thus far really seems to mirror that. Um, we talked. You talked about that you don't like the word manager, you like the word leaders, but there is a definitive difference between the two. How should a leader redefine their role to become a better leader and to get better team engagement? Well, you know, that's a perfect segue because um, there's a book that I read a long time ago and I've read it a couple of times just to keep it fresh and I always recommend it. And, you know, it's, it's kind of famous. Maybe you've seen it. It's called the one minute manager, but you see that I've crossed out the word manager and I now call it the one minute leader. And just as a quick synopsis, first of all, it's a very, thin book. It's less than a hundred pages. It's a very quick read. And I gave it to all of my leaders. And whenever I go into a, a restaurant as a, um, a coaching person, um, a client, I give all of their potential leaders a copy of this book. And we talk about the foundational elements, but it's called the one minute manager, uh, one minute leader for me, because it's all about catching people doing things right. And even if people take on additional responsibility and if they thrive in it, it's like you praise those people for their contributions to your business. And it's called the one minute because 60 seconds, it's just the title of the book, but it doesn't have to be 60 seconds. It could be a five second pat on the back saying, hey, Joe, great job, thanks for doing that. But that's the point, you praise people when they're doing things great in your business. And on the flip side, a boss, or a manager would criticize someone and say, you're not doing that right. This is the way you should be doing it. Go out and do it the right way. That's the boss approach. But a leader is someone who critiques somebody. Now, a boss might reprimand somebody in front of another team member. He might even do it in front of the guests, and that's absolutely unacceptable. A critique is something that happens in private where you point out what the expectation was, and then you ask them, how can you make this change so that it's exactly what, how can you meet the expectation? So that's the one minute leader. The crux of this is accountability. And you can't have accountability unless there's an absolute crystal clear understanding of what the expectation is in that particular job by the leader, okay? And, and knowing that there's a high bar and that there's a standard. So I can go into it. A, you know, a really solid job description looks like, but the accountability piece comes from you as the owner or the leader have an understanding of every single job in that restaurant as if you did it yourself prior. And based on that, you write a job description that has three essential elements to it. At the very top, I call it key success factors, and that's gonna be different for every position in your restaurant. It's simply five or six different words that you expect that person to bring to the table to be effective in that job. And it might be reliability, it might be detail-oriented, it might be hustle, eyes wide open, accuracy with cash, whatever it is, these are the important elements. The meat of it is primary responsibilities. Now, every job is different. Some jobs might have five primary responsibilities. Another might have 10 or 15, doesn't matter. As you, the owner or leader, understanding what the expectations are, you write a very detailed description of each responsibility in every single job. Next to every one of those is a blank line. Why is that there? Because when you sit down with a new hire, or even uh, an existing employee in the business that um, has not had a job description before, I used to sit down and, you know, and have a conversation and we'd go through every single line item and I would say, do you understand what I expect for this responsibility and can you do it to the best of your ability? Now, if it's a new hire, they can say, yes, I understand what you expect, but maybe they don't know how to do it and there's gonna be some training involved. So that's fine. But once they're trained, 
Do you understand? And do you know what to expect? And can you do it to the best of your ability? When they say yes, you have them initial every single line. So now you got five or 10 or 15 initials on that job description. I'll get to why that's important. The bottom is bonusable or incentives for going above and beyond the primary responsibilities. And this may happen over time. You may recognize something in someone and say, if you do all this great, it's the natural next step to move on to this. And if you'd like to, we can get you there. And this is what the bonus or incentive would be if you get there. And there's your job description. Okay, the accountability comes in when you practice this one minute leader thing and you catch somebody either doing something right or when things are going sideways, you bring them into the office in private, of course, and now here's the critique saying, you said that you could do this this way and I'm seeing it that way. And instead of being the boss saying, get out there and do it the right way, you calmly say, how, what do you think you can do to get your performance back on track to meet that expectation? And then you listen for the answer. And now the person goes out there and they don't want to be called on the carpet again. They know they have to change and correct the behavior. They now know what your expectation is. They're going to meet it because they know you're watching. It's that simple. And, and, and people, then there needs to be a performance. I, I think also people have a need to not let people down. I think that we have an inherent, Absolutely true. A, lo, a lot of people on my teams, you know, when they'd made a mistake, 90% of them felt worse about it than I could ever make them feel. <laughs> that's a good point, Mark. It absolutely goes without saying that is true because that's called character, right? That's mm -hmm. called integrity. Yeah. It's called taking pride in yourself as a person and in what you bring to the table if you truly care about getting somewhere in life and doing your best. So yes. absolutely true. Yeah, fantastic. Um, this is absolutely a great conversation as I knew it would be. How can people get in touch with you if they want to explore working with you? Yeah, um, two ways. I have two different companies. Um, Restaurant Rockstars, I didn't really define what that is, but it's based on my 30 years of experience in this business now, but we sell an online training system called the Academy which is very foundational if you're one starting a very first restaurant with no restaurant experience like I did. It's everything you need to know to start op open the doors to that business and then how to run it profitably and successfully. And then if you're an existing operator that just needs to dial in your operation, it's all the systems and staff training, leadership. It's all about teaching your people how to sell. It's all about maximizing your profits and cost controls and inventory and prime costs and all that stuff. And then it's also marketing that is trackable with a return on investment versus just throwing money out the door on experiments. And then there's also efficiencies across your operation. So we sell this product now in 23 countries around the world, which is pretty remarkable considering we haven't translated it into a foreign language. And then we also have a weekly podcast ourselves. It's called the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. And we interview um, industry leaders such as yourself people in best practices, guest service, finance, marketing, technology, all that. And then lastly, um, I'm also a two-time author and then a sometime restaurant coach. Uh, it's not scalable, so I don't do a lot of it, but occasionally an interesting project comes my way and I say, yeah, I'd like to help you out with that. So that's Restaurant Rockstars. We've been doing that for 10 years. I'm a partner in a new um, Seattle-based hospitality technology company where we develop augmented reality and digital training apps and artificial intelligence and hospitality solutions for restaurants, hotels, bars, and resorts. And that's pretty exciting. So we've got some pretty exciting projects on the table with that. So how do you get in touch with me? R-O-G-E-R -E at restaurantrockstars.com if you're interested in hospitality training or profitability or increasing up leveling your operation or if it's a tech question you can reach out to me roger r-o-g-e-r at labs.com wonderful we will Thank put you. the we do have the links in the show notes so people will be able to click on that as well you mentioned you mentioned all sorts of uh, strategies to start kind of 
putting together a, the culture that people need in order to drive their businesses forward. And I know that we've used the word hospitality many times. Um, I just want to, you know, for people who are tuning in, just because you might not be in a restaurant doesn't mean that hospitality doesn't apply to you. I've worked with multiple companies oh, true. across different industries who are customer facing, who absolutely yes. need to build hospitality into their corporate culture. <laughs> so it's not restaurants. Competitive sure. advantage right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. people are, are absolutely foundational. And recognition yeah. and rewards are very important also to up level that culture that we talked about. Yeah. And and again, I have a I have a whole theory about, you know, what it, what gets recognized and rewarded gets repeated. It's a perfect way to be able mm -hmm. to kind of finesse the behavior that we want out of people. Uh, and and ultimately, what I find is when you do it really well, you create FOMO for the people who aren't necessarily behaving up to par. Um, we have to get away from this idea that the squeaky wheel gets the oil <laughs> and we need to maintain the other wheels that are doing just great. Thank you very much. Yeah, we had a recognition program I could go into if you have time. It's called Difference Dollars. Oh, tell us about it. Okay, so in all of my restaurants, we would recognize two people every single week for going above and beyond, making a difference in our business, either for a guest or for a team member. Okay, that was that whole culture thing again. And everyone loved this program. And we did it twice a week because Fridays and Saturdays are the busiest days in any restaurant, of course, and not every employee works on both those days, but you want everyone to be part of this program. So maybe I recognize somebody for making a difference, but I had an open door policy. We talked about giving people a voice and opinion and fixing what's broken, but anyone could knock on my door at any time and say, hey, Roger, you got a second? And I would always drop whatever I was doing because my people were most important. And maybe someone else nominated and said, hey, Roger, you got to hear what Sally did this week. Oh, tell me what Sally did this week. And that would form the basis of who would be the nomina nominees for the program. How did it work? Every Friday and Saturday before start of service, either in the dining room or in the kitchen, I would gather the entire team together. I'd get up on my soapbox and I would go into glowing detail. And this week's winner is Sally. And this is what Sally did to make a difference. And I would talk all about what it was. And then everyone would clap. I would give Sally a $20 bill and a can of Red Bull, but it didn't stop there. I would go into my office and I had a template on the computer, big stars in the corners. It said difference dollars, big and bold. And she got her 20 bucks and she got a Red Bull, but the recognition didn't stop there. I would now print Sally Johnson. And this is what Sally did that made a difference. And I had all these inexpensive frames in my office that I got either at Target or Walmart, you know, the eight and a half by 11 standard size frames. I would hang them in the kitchen and in the employee area and in the hallway and in the employee bathroom where they hung up their coats. And when I sold those businesses, there were like hundreds of these differences all over the place. But it was so gratifying whenever we hired somebody new and they might have been a dishwasher working for five or 10 minutes and they did something great and we would recognize them. But on their break, whoever it was, you couldn't help but notice they're like walking and they're reading all these differences. And that spoke volumes about our culture, that hospitality, family, and fun thing I talked about. That up-leveled the team. They look forward to different dollars every week and everybody just went out of their way to deliver true hospitality. So I that, love that, that. It was awesome. And it was so simple. So you might call it a cost. Some people would say 40 bucks and two cans of Red Bull every week. It was such an investment in amazing guest service and in team spirit and camaraderie and company culture. You can't put a price on that. It was priceless. Yeah. And it's funny because short-sighted people would look at it and go, oh, but you know, our product cost is so high. Our labor cost is so high and now. And now you're saying we're, we're going to throw more money yet to it. But again, these are just simple little things. And the return on investment is so incredibly huge. Can we talk, sure. when we're talking about investment, can you talk a little bit about the power of training our staff? Yeah, there's so many restaurants that don't go so far as having a simple pre-shift exercise, which is a foundational element also. And it doesn't take 20 minutes and it doesn't take a half an hour. But if you have a focused five minutes with every single person front and back of house to, together as a team and you focus on hospitality and you focus on having a strategy, what are you going to talk to your tables about today? Or what's going to happen in the back of house to get through service with 
minimal hiccups and the maximum efficiency so that every dish has wow factor and there's no mistakes and that everything's cooked. To, you know, we talk about this stuff and having product and restaurant knowledge so that we can make suggestions. And I had a whole program created around that, but that's a, a pre-shift. And that should happen every single day before every start of service. And if you're doing three meals a day, I recommend you do three pre-shifts a day because the team all changes. That was one training we did. And then once a month, every month, this was, this was awesome. We did two things. We did something called how to turn $100 into $1,000. And I'll talk to tell you about that. That was only for front of house people. And I might have 20 or 30 people sitting in the dining room and we'd go through this role playing exercise where I'd say, Sally, you're going to be the guest and Jimmy, you're going to be the host and Johnny, you're going to be the server. I want each of you to go through and deliver an amazing dining experience and just kind of role play. What are you going to suggest? What are you going to tell the customer? What questions are you going to ask to get to know your guests on a personal level? And if they did a good job, I had a stack of money on the table. And that's where the hundred dollars came from in the title of this exercise. I went to the bar drawer or the petty cash and I'd have a $20 bill, two tens, two fives, and the rest $1 bills all randomly shuffled sitting in the middle of the table. If you did a great job in the role play, you could take a bill off the stack. You might get a 20, you might get a 10, you might get a one, doesn't matter. It just made it an interactive and fun exercise. Well, those people went out and they, made amazing recommendations to their guests and they would literally turn that hundred bucks into a thousand dollars in increased sales and that would go on and then a month later we'd do it again that was the first thing we did the second really powerful thing i did was i gave people percentages if they came up with really amazing ideas because i recognize that my people that are in the trenches every day see things in virtue of doing their job, ways to increase efficiency, a better way of doing something, something that might save costs or increase a profit. And I said, I'm gonna make a list, throw out any ideas in this meeting. We got flip charts and Sharpies, just write it on the board. I'm gonna look at all these ideas and put a short list together every single month. And if any of these ideas look like I can track it, either it's gonna save us money or increase our profit. I'm going to give you a percentage of that for as long as you work for me, as long as it continues to deliver the savings or the profit. I had people that worked for me for 18 years that were still collecting extra money because 18 years ago, they came up with an ingenious idea that continued to keep us efficient and they got extra money for doing so. That up leveled the organization like you wouldn't believe, because it's not just about me as the leader or the owner. It's about all these people and that created a culture and that created longevity and that lowered turnover and i'll tell you the amount of money it costs when you have high turnover versus just giving people incentives and bonuses to keep them and up leveling them huge difference there and and you know you also create the culture where people are playing at work right? yeah, they people, were. Yes, people yes. are doing stuff that, that's fun and so they come work. to work thinking I, I i want to accomplish this i want to make this happen i want to do this Absolutely true. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting because I find I find that, you know, especially the grassroots organizations where we have grassroots, uh, what we call semi-skilled or unskilled labor comes in and people kind of sneer down to it. Uh, but there's a magic when you are able to connect with people at that level that even if they're minimum wage employees, some some of them will give us their very, very best if we figure out what we can do to motivate them. Totally agree. Yeah. So yeah. again, there's that paradigm shift, right? It's a different approach. It's a different way of thinking, but far more effective if you can sort of assimilate some of these ideas and use them in your own organization and just kind of change the way you treat people and give them a voice and ask them what's broken and give them incentives and recognition and rewards. And it's like, wow, that's so much power in that. And I've seen it firsthand. And, and what I would challenge anybody tuning into this episode, if you question the value of the, like the monetary gifts and the incentives and that sort of thing, take your labor, uh, what it costs you to engage one person, multiply it by 300 times, and that is the cost that, it will, that will afford you that you're going to be offsetting from the labor turnover in the cost of actually recruiting, the time it takes to train people and get them up to speed, the customer satisfaction while you're making the transition and everything else, it's all there. And you know, you can look at it and say, well, why don't you set a budget, take a look at your recruitment. If you were to replace five people, find out what that cost is, and then set a budget that now can become your reward and recognition program. 
Wow. I love it. I love there. putting numbers to things. You know, a lot of people are intimidated by numbers and they think they're terrible at math, but we're talking yeah. about simple stuff here and it makes yeah. a huge difference in your business. And that's a mindset shift as well. But I love yeah, that when, one. Great. When we come back, I'd like to talk about some cautionaries we should be aware of when people are kind of wanting to fix what's broken, what they can, what we have to be very, very cautious of. And we'll do that right after this. Uh when you're delivering an important speech to a huge audience, it's easy to lose your place or go way over time. Give yourself an advantage with the Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app. No more checking your watch or calling for time. The Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app keeps you on track with easy to see timers, even changing color for visual prompts during your speech. And you can set audio cues to practice or set it to vibrate so you don't even have to look. Be the pro you know you are. Download the app at speakerpresentationtimer.com. We are having an absolutely amazing dis discussion. I hope you're getting lots by tuning into it. As evident from our discussion today, Roger and I are deeply dedicated to supporting business leaders just like you. So if you're in the midst of planning a leadership retreat or an industry conference, or you're just needing some expert guidance, we're here to help you. Feel free to message us. Our contact information is in the show notes. It'll be our pleasure to serve you because we're here to be of service. <laughs> Roger, what advice would you give to a new leader in, in all of this to avoid common pitfalls? I know specifically the grassroots people are the ones who get promoted because they're wonderful. They do a great job. If you could, if you could become a supervisor and show people how well you can do it, and, and then they they crash and burn. So we definitely need to figure out what is it that we need to tell new leaders to avoid all these pitfalls? Yeah, probably the most basic thing is maintaining impartiality and not showing favoritism. Even if we have fantastic employees, we can't constantly be praising them and and not, pr not showing others the same, um, obviously, recognition for things. But you can't ignore what's broken. And if someone is a disciplinary problem, you can't overlook it. You can't... Um, you know, turn your blind eye to things. You got to maintain rock solid consistency. And we talked about the accountability. We talked about job descriptions, but we also have to have performance reviews and we have to let people know how they're doing. And a lot of restaurants aren't doing that. So if I'm a new leader, um, one, I would have that job description. I would have the accountability piece by getting the expectations met. And then I would definitely not hesitate to call somebody out in private, of course, when they're not performing because everyone else is watching. Um, so you got to maintain that consistency for sure. And then disciplinary procedure has to be in place for any infraction. There are minor infractions in organizations, there are bigger ones. A minor one might be someone who's perpetually tardy. And maybe there, and there has to be a consequence for that. If they're perpetually tardy, then maybe they lose a, a, a solid shift on a Saturday or, or something, but it sets an example. And then if it's more serious infraction, maybe it's bullying, maybe it's some kind of harassment, you need to definitely not ignore that and tackle it the right way. And some of those are challenging situations, but our people are watching every single day and they know if you're a leader or they know if you're just someone that holds the title of manager. So all those things are, are important, but consistency and impartiality is so foundational to what we're talking about. It really is. And, you know, in that built within the consistency and an impartiality is the whole contact, the whole virtue of respect. <laughs> because that, yeah. that's all, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're tied together um, yeah. by respect, um, that we're, no matter what we're doing, we're, we're never ever disrespecting our people. Um, Very which I, which I've seen. I, I, in fact, in my book, I wrote about how I was in this one, um, this one management meeting. It was um, all the mid managers, entry level managers and the owner. And, they started talking about Donna and they started talking in derogatory terms about how lazy Donna was. And, and I had to stop the meeting as a consultant. I, I had to actually stop it and say, this is a, a growth opportunity. If you're talking about Donna as a group in such disrespectful terms, how are your younger managers going to go out and face Donna? How do they go eye to eye with Donna to lead, to be effective and so on? without having that contempt sneak into it. And from that part, point on, that was how we had to yeah. turn the tables on that. Oh, absolutely. Oh, for sure. Yeah.
And everyone's got a different personality and a different way of thinking about things. And it goes yes. far beyond personal style, but it's like getting everybody on the same page with different personalities and different belief systems and different opinions is one of the most challenging things as a leader too. But that's where the pre-shifts come in and the team yes. bonding and the exercises and the recognition rewards. That's what break down the walls of these differences with people. And, you know, the difference dollars thing and all the things we talked about before when you have a true company culture new hires either know instantly i fit here or i don't and yep. if they don't feel comfortable with a, a healthy competition and high expectations and a high standard then they kind of vote themselves off the island you don't even have to fire people after a while you know yep. people either assimilate that culture and they fit with it or they don't and you obviously want to maintain that very high standard of having A and B players where your Bs are mentoring and shadowing and moving into an A position. And then suddenly, if you've got an organization filled with A players, how powerful is that on both the guest side and how efficient the business runs? Absolutely. This has been such a fabulous conversation, Roger. Uh, as we wrap up, do you have any last thoughts about what we've been talking about today? Yeah, I mean, one day at a time, it's like some of these things may seem overwhelming, but you chip away at something and you put systems in place over time. It doesn't happen overnight, but if you can dedicate a little bit of time every single day to improving your business and taking some of these things to heart and getting some cues from the conversation that you know would work in your organization in a short period of time, I think you'll be surprised with the results. So there's no finish line. You know, your business yep. is a journey. It's not a destination. It's every single day seeking improvement and just trying to make your organization better for both the guests and the team. Brilliant. Can you remind everybody one more time how they can get a hold of you? Yes, Roger, R O G E R at restaurantrockstars.com. If you're interested in obviously guest service or staff or leadership training or profitability in your business, I can help you there. Or we have a system for that at the website, restaurantrockstars.com. Or if you're interested in restaurant technology and moving your business forward with some of the latest and greatest, then I'm a partner in a company called Hospitality Innovation Labs. And my, uh, my email is R-O-G-E-R -E at hospitalityinnovationlabs.com. Thank you. Love it. Roger, thank you so much for sharing your passion and your expertise with us today. It truly has been brilliant. Thank you for doing this. I so enjoyed talking with you, Mark. It's been a great conversation. And uh, I love talking shop with operators and anything we could do to help move our industry forward. That's what we're both all about. Absolutely. Thank you again. Why don't you let me know if this was of value to you? As always, my offer stands. If you would like 30 minutes of my time to brainstorm your business with you and your team, feel free to book yourself on my online calendar. The link is in the show notes. It would be my absolute honor to be of service. And while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and leave a comment or a review about this episode? I'd love to get your feedback. Was this of value to you? Did you learn anything? And of course, if you haven't done so yet, please make sure you are subscribed to this podcast. That way you get notification when I bring you really amazing guests like Roger each and every week. My name is Mark Hain. I hope you stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope you dare to be the exception. Bye for now.